god, what is ringing? Do you guys hear that? Is it obnoxious? This who is you? Why, why do I have to tell you my name? I don't know if it's in my house. Oh. It, it was the bottle. I was like, <laughs> the spirits, they're spoken. <laughs> I literally was like, oh my God, guys, this is like, this is like, if we're like in the light <laughs> of a psychic, they're talking to me. Turns out I was squeezing the bottle too hard and the air was releasing and so it was ringing or it was whatever, whatever. <laughs>
maybe pushing further into my journey, maybe going a year into me really trying to work with spirit guides, I got assigned, and that's what I call it, right? Another guide, a woman, her name was Anne. She didn't speak much, she didn't do much, but she told me that her role specifically was sort of for like motherhood and different things like that. And um, which made sense because at that time I was in a serious relationship. We were considering having children at that time. And that is actually when she was assigned to me and she became very present in my life. As the relationship kind of started to fall apart and then we broke up, she took, she completely backed out to the point where I don't actually see her as much anymore. And if I do, she's very faint and she's all the way in the back. It was usually just Jeremy. Jeremy. Now, what my team looks like now, what my council looks like now, there's a lot. I usually have about eight guides, right? In addition to Jeremy. So Jeremy is the number one and then there's usually eight more in addition to him. Then I have angelic guides that pop in from time to time. I have a huge, massive ancestral team that has a tendency to grow and shrink depending on what it is that I'm doing. Um, they are very sort of um, traditional, sort of um, African warriors. They carry their spears still with me. So when they stand behind me, they're all armed, so to speak. And in front of them, I have the elders, all women that stand in front of them. So that is like my, that's my counsel. When it comes to the eight spirit guides, in addition to my main guy named Jeremy, the way they work is that there'll be one that's prominent, right? That'll speak. And then they'll speak to me as a collective, as a unit. So they'll decide amongst themselves what they want to say. And then there's one spokesperson that tells me what it is that they all want me to know, right? And from time to time, what I'll notice is that two or three will go up, meaning like ascend, right? And then there'll be an open spot for two or three. And then right after they leave, there's two to three new ones that come down and they take their spot. So I have a solid eight that are um, revolving and they all come for different reasons and they all tell me what the reasons are, like kind of what their specialism is. I say all that, all that to say is that all of your guides have specialisms, right? Which is why you won't have the idea of having one guide and one guy for life doesn't make a lot of sense, particularly if you are someone that has a lot to do spiritually on this earth. If that has a lot to do with your soul's purpose on this earth, you will notice that you will get more and that they'll swap out or that you'll meet more from time to time. And you'll be like, "Why? where'd you come from? It's because they have different specialisms and they all focus and they all do different things. Why is that? Spirit guides in particular were once incarnate on this planet mean or not this planet a planet right they were somewhere at some point in time a spirit guide was fleshy they were of flesh most likely it was on this particular planet is this is not a hard fast rule this is not set in stone but the reason why it's a heavy emphasis on the most likely is because this particular planet has a it's very unique sets of circumstances and so it makes sense that you would have guy of a guide or guides that are familiar with working with the energies of this particular planet and so that is what will happen but your guides have at some point in their eternal life been incarnate somewhere right your guides can also be previous loved ones your guides can be ancestors and when I say previous loved ones what I mean by that is sometimes people in your life can pass away and they can join your spirit team. This is not always the case. A lot of times people think that because they had someone that they really love, maybe let's say your grandparent or something, that that grandparent automatically joins the spiritual team. This is actually not true. A spirit guy's role is, is very different than maybe an ancestral role. Now they will automatically join your ancestral team. They can also straddle both and be both ancestors in the spirit guy. But a lot of times they just get us, they just go to your ancestral team. The reason being is that they can do what they need to do from that side. It's not like being a spirit guide holds a whole list of other stuff, right? For them to do, they can do what they can do from the spiritual, from the ancestral side. And you also have to consider it from the perspective of if all of your ancestors stay together and they group, they're a lot stronger as one mass than being split between two groups, if that makes sense, right? So those are your spirit guides. You can have as 
many spirit guides as your soul needs to have. You can have as many spirit guides as agreed upon before you became incarnate and you, you came down. Now, how are spirit guides assigned? Spirit guides are assigned before you actually decide to come through the womb, okay? Spirit guides are actually part of the soul contract. So you're, you, so you, like, it's, it's, it's a relationship, right? Like your spirit guides also, by the way, can be people that you'd have known in past lives, right? Sometimes it happens as spirit guides. Maybe it was an old friend. Maybe it was a sister that you had three lifetimes ago. There's so many reasons, but a lot of times a spirit guide is part of the soul family. When we think of soul family, we think of soul family in terms of like, we all incarnate at the same time. And then we come down to this earth at the same time. No, some of your soul family is still in spirit. They're not always going to incarnate together. It doesn't mean that they're not part of the same soul family. So sometimes your guide can simply be a part of the soul family, right? But it can be in numerous things. Then you may have your angelic guides. If you're someone that works with the angels, you may have interdimensional guides or different things like that. Um, but that's my team and that's my council. So my ancestral council is usually a minimum of 50 or so ancestors. Not all of them I've met in this life. I have a lot of conversations of like, who are you? When did I know you? And they can grow to about 200, depending on what's going on in my life and how much protection I may need at the moment. And then they kind of come and go and they shrink and they kind of tag each other out and different things like that. Now, that is the spirit council. That's my team, right? So, but on top of that, you can also get guidance from um, higher dimensional beings that are not your guides at all. And so this is something that people don't talk to you about in this process when you're trying to figure out what your guides are. Some people have actually said to me, I thought I saw somebody, you know, and they told me what their name was, but I haven't seen them again. And I'm like, that's great. They probably just had guidance. Doesn't mean that they were your guide, right? It doesn't mean that they were assigned to you. They maybe just had guidance. There are lots of higher dimensional beings that just have guidance and they want to come and they share a message with you because they think it's relevant and that you can receive it and that you can spread it. But after that, they're not assigned to you. An example of this are light beings. And I will put the picture somewhere over here showing you what they actually look like, right? By the way, they are massive, a real intimidating force when you actually see them up close. So light beings, right? I'm pointing like this because I don't know where I put it on the screen. Um, they are not assigned to anybody, but they do provide guidance. It's part of their kind of makeup and like what do they what they do? They kind of just spread love, right? Through throughout the multiverse. And so if they feel like they have a message for you in particular, a lot of times they will make sure to drop in and they'll tell you what it is, right? And I remember actually having a conversation with them before and maybe I'll put it in, a, I'll have to put it in a different video because it's just going to go too long. But they did tell me, long story short, that they don't serve as guides for anybody, that they're not assigned to anyone ever in particular, that they are simply there to help the collective and so they go when they're needed. However, they also did say that they are the type that if you want to call upon them for questions or assistance, that you may do that and that they will appear for you if you want to ask them something, right? And so they have guidance, right? And this is really interesting to say because a lot of us identify with the concept of a light being or only working with light beings, right? And so what happens is we think that they're part of our spirit guide team and they're not. They are just spirits with guidance, right? So there is um, a difference. But I wanted to kind of touch on that because um, there are no hard and fast rules for spirit guides. Now, if you want to communicate with spirit guides, and I feel like some of you may be watching going, but how do I talk to them? So honestly, the number one answer, this is probably not the answer you wanted to hear because this is probably an answer that you feel like you hear for everything is meditation. I'm going to tell you why the meditation is important. The meditation is not important so you can, so you can talk to them. It's not a matter of your spirit guides won't talk to you if you don't meditate. The reason why meditation is important is because meditation trains you to discipline your mind. It trains you to move your consciousness other places. When you have the ability to move your consciousness to the side, you now have room to accept other consciousness, right? So you can hear them, you can hear it, you can sense it, you can feel it, you can see it, you can communicate with other consciousness because you have had you have learned to discipline yours to the point of being able to move yours to the side. 
when you move your consciousness to the side, that also lets you know that you're in a place of being able to set aside ego, right? Because you have to get to the point where you can remove your ego from your consciousness. But you can't move your ego, remove your ego from your consciousness if you haven't yet learned how to move your consciousness and you can't move your consciousness if you don't know how to meditate, okay? You have to learn how to discipline your mind and you have to learn how to quiet it and it comes in meditation because at the end of the day, your spirit guides are always speaking to you. It's never a sense of they only speak when you're meditating. That is just the only time you have the ability to hear them, right, is through meditation. Another way you can try um, is, is writing. So when you're just in a calm space, get yourself a notebook, a blank notebook and a pen, and you can say out loud, like, I'm ready for your guidance. Say, I want to meet you. Say, I want to know you. Tell me who you are. Ask questions out loud, like, who are you? How do we know each other? What's your name? Ask questions out loud and then write the first thing you feel inclined to write. And the way you know that you're picking up on messages instead of picking up on your own thoughts is being able to determine what thought was yours and what thought was not yours. So if you hear something or you feel like you're picking up on information that wasn't a you thought, meaning you would have never thought that information on your own or you would have never, you, like it just wouldn't have come to you, it didn't belong to you. If it was a thought that didn't belong to you, then that is not your thought. That is the easiest way to know if you're actually picking up on messages from spirit. If it's something that did not belong to you, if it's a feeling that did not belong to you, if you see something and you know that the vision that you saw did not belong to you, that's how you know that you're actually receiving a message from spirit. And you can actually start working on that as well. When you are getting to know your spirit guides, do not be frustrated or um, upset because sometimes what happens is that people say to their guides, what's your name? And they don't get a name back, right? Um, how do we know each other? And then they're not told these answers back. Why are you my spirit guide? And they're not told these answers back. It's not because you're not picking up on the answer or you're not meditating hard enough. It's because your guide has made the decision not to tell you because it's not pertinent information for you to know. They, as humans, right? We are always on a need to know basis with spirit. It's just the way it is. The reason why is our consciousness level has not developed enough for them to tell us everything. It will literally blow our minds. So they don't. So they give it, they piecemeal it and they give you bits and pieces that you can handle and that you can digest. If they told you everything about them at one time, you may not be able to receive it or you may think to yourself that you made it up. Right. So they wait until you guys have a good enough relationship with each other to start divulging more and heavier information. If they're not telling you what their name is yet. It's probably because they just don't feel like it's pertinent information for you to know at that time. Right. But it doesn't mean that you won't get their name. It's kind of like imagine if you like went to a supermarket and somebody you didn't know all of, all of a sudden came up to you and said, hey, what's your name? Your first response is, who is you? Why, why do I have to tell you my name? Right. It's kind of the same way, you know, your spirit guides have personalities and your spirit guides have a sense of humor. You have to remember at one point in time, your spirit guide was incarnate, which meant they were physical, which meant they most likely were human. Most likely um, is this, this again is not a hard, fast rule, but most likely at some point in time, they were human. So they are, they have personalities. They laugh, they crack jokes. Some of them are very moody. I have met moody spirit guides from people, right? Just moody because that was their temperament when they were incarnate. I have met spirit guides that were jokers. You know, they, they have their own sort of personality. So they just may not want to, right? It doesn't mean that they won't at some point in time. That's what it is. So try meditation and then try um, writing to them and writing them letters and then let them write back to you through whatever it is that they say, right? You can also ask them before you go to sleep, you can ask them to meet you in one of your dreams that night, right? And you can practice this through just kind of practicing lucid dreaming, you know, but you also have to remember so much of spirituality and being able to communicate with spirit is having the ability to um, alternate between various mind states, alternate between different levels of, of consciousness, right? And so you have to know that they don't exist at our everyday waking level of consciousness, right? Because we're at a very low density. They are much higher than we are. And so we do have to allow ourselves to achieve those altered, elevated states of consciousness to be able to communicate to them 
better. And then once you start getting to a place to communicate, don't be hard on yourself because you have to also realize that you then have to translate that information. And this is something else that people don't always understand either. Like you get, they send you information the best way they can. It has to go through the human generator, right? And then it has to go through the translator to get to your language, whatever that is. It may not be English, right? And then after that, you have to make sense of what got translated and then you have to push it out of you in the form of language that makes sense to you, right? That takes practice. Learning how to be an interpreter because that's what you are when you are a psychic, when you are a medium, when you are a channel, you are an interpreter for spirit, right? So that takes practice too. Feeling something and then being able to put words to it are two different things and it comes with time. So don't beat yourself up over it. So, um, but I think that that can actually kind of help you on your sort of spirit guide journey. I hope, fingers crossed, if that like works, um, you know, let me know in the comments kind of how far that, that got you. And then if some of you guys have other tips for how to communicate with spirit guides, leave those in the comments too, because I'm sure other people will stumble across this video and they would find it really, really helpful. And we can sort of build a cute little, you know, spiritual community for each other where everybody has a place to go to ask questions and they can get feedback from everybody else on like really awesome things to do. So I hope that was super helpful for you guys. I know it's not as formal as it normally is, but I don't feel like it. It's my channel, so it's my rules. I do what I want, but I do hope that it was that it was helpful and it kind of gives you insight into how it could look because it is not as cookie cutter as people try to make it seem. And as always, guys, if you like what you see, subscribe to this channel and I will see you guys soon.